and new books for spring summer 2015. This is books on explorers and commerce and business and then history, but mostly war history. Uh, so here's here's a book on Mr. Selden's map of China. Decoding the Secrets of a Vanished Cartographer. This is by Timothy Brook. And the book is actually all about this map here, which is maybe hard to see. But it was an ancient map that was given to Oxford, Oxford Library. It says here in 1659, it was given to some library at Oxford. And no one knew what it meant, so it was just ignored. But back in, I guess, 2009, Timothy Brook, who is the actual author of this, he studied this map and figured out what it means. And the whole book, I guess, is him figuring out what this map means. So I thought that was pretty neat. And he's also the author of Vermeer's Hat, which is a book I also have, which is a fantastic um, book on art, Vermeer's art, um, uh, which is great. I think he was, I don't know if he's Italian or not, but... Um, uh, very nice book also. So this is another one, so I'm happy to get into that sometime. Here's a book on the fur trade, Pulling the Canada-U.S. The Canada Trade Agreement in Historical Perspective, on fur trade to free trade, it says, by Randall White, second edition. I thought that might be neat to look at. It's got a few pictures in it. Um, probably political cartoons from the time. So I thought that might be neat. There's one there. And I am interested in trade and stuff, so I'd be, I'm curious what what uh, this will be about. And um, I like uh, colonization. There's all kinds of fur trading going on there, so I'm kind of interested in the period. Here's the power makers, steam, electricity, and the men who invented modern America. Uh, this is by uh, Maury, Maury Klein. Let me just see who's in here. Um... There is, oh, it doesn't say any names, but I imagine this has all kinds of good stuff on trains and electricity and stuff, so that should be good. And here is a, a, a neat one. Um, you may know who Ezra Levant is, Ethical Oil. I actually found this in a used bookstore. Um, Ezra Levant is a Canadian um, conservative... Um, I guess he's a pundit, but he's he's kind of on the activist side, and he has been um, probably most famously he's been um, opposed to and critical of what's called the Human Rights Commission in Canada, which is a supposedly a, dis, a dispute organization with no powers. Um, they're not in the Constitution, and they're just been invented by bureaucrats uh, to handle disputes over human rights or what are called human rights and um, anyways Ezra Levin actually got charged with something I think it was um, publishing Muslim car those Muslim cartoons in his magazine that he had at the time and he was hauled in front of the the Alberta Human Rights Commission and there's actually some really good YouTube videos um, with a lot of views hundreds of thousands of views, that he taped his, um, um, not an interrogation, but he taped his forced meetings with the Human Rights Commission. And it's actually not what you think. It's just one lady in a room, and he's delivering his statements that he prepared, and he's answering the questions of this lady and his lawyers sitting beside him. So it's quite interesting to look at. Anyways, Ezra Levant is also... A defender of what are called the oil sands in Alberta. Sometimes they're called the tar sands, but that's a derogatory. Um, they're, um, and so, and his basic point in this book, he calls it ethical oil. The oil coming out of Canada and the states, I guess, is ethical compared to what he calls conflict oil coming out of the Middle East. And what he points out is he points out the hypocrisy of environmental groups who will protest at oil sands and pipeline. Uh, stuff, but won't protest at um, what are they called? Like Middle Eastern oil, whatever that union's called. Um, not uh, what is it called? Um, OPEC. 
OPEC uh, groups. They won't protest those things. And there's a bit of a conspiracy. Some people think that actually, um, for example, the Tides Foundation, the States, and some other environmental groups like Greenpeace, they're actually being funded by some of these OPEC oil, com oil countries to protest only oil coming from the oil sands and the pipelines, which essentially will be pumping oil from the oil sands. Um, there's a bit of that going on, but anyways, um, as, Ezra Levant's main point is that why not support oil coming from modern democracies that have human rights versus and, and protest oil that come from overseas from countries that don't have human rights, like the middle, countries in the Middle East. And he also says, which is I think a great argument, he says that he he measures the that's this is why he calls it conflict oil. He measures the amount of violence in these countries, and he then adds to the barrel of oil how many liters of blood have been spilled over that oil to get it to Western countries. And he's his argument is that when you purchase OPEC oil, you're also purchasing blood from that country in in the um, in terms of violence that has occurred in that country. Thus, why not purchase um, Canadian oil or American oil or whatever? And another thing he says, which I think is kind of neat, is why not have on our gas tank, or not our gas tanks, at the pump, at the gas station, why not have um, gas pumps that, that have actually the country on them? So when you go to the gas pump and you pick 87 octane, 89 octane, 91 octane, or whatever. Why can't we also pick country of origin? Why can't we pick Canada, Norway, you know, America, Venezuela, um, Saudi Arabia, you know, etc. Right? Why can't we pick these countries too? And would there may be a difference in price? But I bet you, if people saw the country of origin, I think he calls it country of origin labeling. If this was in in place. People might pick non-conflict oil, but environmental groups don't care about that. They only care that it's oil. So, and he compares oil sand oil with California heavy, I think it's called, and there's some other random ones like that. So, looking at the kind of carbon footprint that these things have, what what is the cost of getting the, the barrel of oil out of the ground? How many barrels of oil do you have to burn to produce a barrel of oil? That kind of stuff. So, he does do those measurements as well, but... His main point is the ethical point, not the oil point. Where it comes from is important. That's his main point. Okay, so now some history. Uh, this is The Gateway to History um, by Alan Nevins. A nice little pocket paperback. And, and this book is basically on the field of history itself. And so it's kind of an introduction. He says here he discusses every, everywhere from... Thucydides, who was a Greek general, actually, um, and then into the most recent scholarship of Europe and America. And looking at the various approaches to history, um, so when you're going to write a history, what perspective are you writing from? Who is important in your history? So you might write from a biographical context. You might write from a cultural context, an intellectual a, ge a geographical, political. Often when we read histories, it's only talking about the kings and queens, right? The, pol the political class, what's been happening there. Very rarely do you get books that, that are like the daily life of a, an ordinary Greek citizen in ancient Greece, right? Which I think I, I have a book on. I think I have a book on the daily life of India. Um, a random person in India, the daily life, which is kind of neat to read. But you see how you can write histories from various perspectives and what you think is um, what you're looking to focus on. Do you want to focus on the daily lives of a common citizen? Do you want to focus on the kings and queens, which is, which is a traditional way, the political, because the political is often the source of war and all that? Do you want to focus on the cultural changes in, in clothing and food and trade and stuff like that? So I thought this would be a neat um, opening about more of the philosophy of history and how it's done. Okay, now getting into um, history, but more chronologically and more about events. So here's Napoleon. Here's a book on Napoleon um, by Felix Markham. I thought this would be nice to have um, on Napoleon, this short guy on a horse who um, really France is... Um, it's unbelievable that France ran over so much of Europe with this, with this Napoleon guy. 
And then not that long after, what, 150 years or so, um, less than that, about 100 years or a little more than 100 years, they get completely decimated and run over by Germany in World War II. It's just amazing how that can happen. Yet, a hundred years earlier, with Napoleon, France can r run up into Russia. So it's just amazing how that happens. Here's one on British British Special for uh, Forces: the story of Britain's undercover soldiers um, by William Seymour, forward by David Sterling, founder of the SAS, whatever that is. I thought this would be pretty neat to read about British Special Forces, and I'm hoping James Bond's in here because that that's important. There should be a um, um, an M and um, a, uh, what was his name? Not Q. I was going to say Q. Was his name Q? The guy who made stuff for James Bond. I can't remember now. But anyways, I'm hoping that to get a little bit of the actual history of British Special Forces as opposed to the James Bond movies because I used to watch all the James Bond movies because I really liked them. But I'm hoping that book talks about some other stuff. That, are there actually James Bonds out there? I'd like to know. I'll be curious. Um, here's Bill O'Reilly's um, Killing Patton, The Strange Death of World War II's Most Audacious General. I don't know if it's going to be any good because it is Bill O'Reilly, and I don't know if he's a good writer or not. Maybe he is, and maybe his co-writer, uh, this Martin Duggard guy, maybe he pulled the book together to make it readable. But anyways, I'll find out. I don't really have anything on Patton, and I do appreciate um, the importance of generals. Um, here's a nice little map. So this is probably one of the reasons why I bought it, too, because of these maps. I think it would be kind of neat to, to look at these and look at deployments and all that. So that should be interesting. Hopefully it's good. I don't, you know, I'm not, really, not a fan of Bill O'Reilly, but I'm hoping that the book is good. Um, here is a giant book on um, great battles. Master Strokes of War. Just a giant book with big pictures. And, oh, a giant bookmark for some reason. I always find these little these bookmarks in books randomly. Probably because I've bought in so many that I guess it's obvious that I find them by now. But I I just thought it'd be neat to have a book that just goes through a few pages each on various battles and stuff, and we need to kind of flip through. And it's basically a coffee table book, right? So okay, so now some stuff on World War Two. No end, save victory. Perspectives on World War II. Essays by a bunch of people I don't know except for John Keegan I know. And, more importantly, although I do have some books by John Keegan, and I think he's a good writer. More importantly, um, Victor Davis Hanson is in here, which I'm more interested in reading. Um, but, yeah, so this should be great. Let me just find where Victor Davis Hanson is. Uh, there's a lot of chapters in this. It's a big, hefty book. But um, the main reason I bought this was Victor Davis Hanson. And he is in here somewhere. There he is. The Right Man, Armageddon in, in, in the Pacific, 1944-45. to 45. And um, Victor Davis Hanson has a chapter in here called The Right Man. So who was the right man? So Victor Davis Hanson's chapter here is about an air offensive on... Japanese home islands, 1945. Major General Curtis LeMay. That's what he's talking about. So, I thought this would be neat. And I like Victor Davis Hanson. So I got, that's the only reason I got that, pretty much. Um, here's an old book. The Canadians at War, 1939-45. to 45. Um, Really, Britain has needs, needs to be still thanking us for that. Because without... Canada, Britain would have been screwed, especially for supplies. So, I just wanted to find the, this is a Reader's Digest, I guess, uh, print. I just wanted to find the um, publication date, if I can. Volume 1, 1969. This is just Volume 1. But there's all kinds of giant pictures in here, too. Which is always kind of nice to read and have pictures every now and then. To kind of... Um, See what you're what what's being talked about, and it's always kind of neat to see the old pictures and stuff. So that should be nice. I don't have a lot of books on Canadians at war, but their contribution is definitely noted in World War II. So see on D-Day, um, here's the fall of Berlin, 1945, uh, by Anthony Beaver, and this 
should be pretty fantastic, I think. Let me just see, uh, publication date is 2002. And so this should be, I guess, it, uh, apparently, the Jer uh, the Russians um, uh, took over Berlin first, and then the uh, the West came in, the, everybody else came in. But, uh, yeah, the Russians, I think, uh, took it over first. So there's a few plates in here of uh, pictures. So anyways, those are my new books for history for uh, spring, summer 2015.